Hey everybody, welcome to the XP Gaming Podcast with Ronald, aka Eric. And as for me, you can call me Mike, MTB, MTB Trigger, really whatever you want. But whatever you're going to call us, we're two dudes with some microphones and we're talking about games. So we're glad to have you. We're back. It's episode two and we're going to stick with the WoW series this time around. But before we get rolling, do us a favor, smash that thumbs up button and consider subscribing if you like this because YouTube's just an interesting place these days, and any help you can give us leveling up our YTXP, as it were, is a great, great help. So today on the show, we're going to be talking about exciting achievements in WoW, WoW Classic, that is, where our journey is at right now in the game, probably some drama, and anything else that comes up along the way. But but first, but first, as always, we got to know, Eric, where is the cow dancing this week? This week, the cow is dancing in the iconic place in Orgrimmar, right in front of the bank on the mailbox. The social hub, if you will, of Orgrimmar. So we're pretty excited to have uh, have our cow dancing right there. I mean, Orgrimmar is an extremely popular spot to just AFK to. So I'm guessing it's a little more active than what we saw in the Undercity last week. Yeah, there's more people. And the nice thing is with WoW Classic, the phasing doesn't exist anymore. The layering as they had when it was coming out. So you don't really have to wait to see people. It just, uh, everyone is there. And so it really creates a sense that the world is alive and that people aren't just, uh, you know, by themselves. Right, they're actually running around doing something. Yep, you can actually see other people, which makes the game actually feel like it's it's pretty alive. It's pretty cool. So there's plenty of people running around in Ogremar today. And uh, it's a lot of fun to be dancing on the mailbox. I think the funniest part is we saw that rogue that was like doing lock picking on top of the bank, which is like the number one meeting spot in classic is meet me on top of the bank. Is he still unlocking boxes right now? Yeah, he's still up there on the top. You may see him talking here. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it's it's good stuff. I mean, it's always the spot where you can go and tell somebody, hey, I want to meet you at the bank. And they know exactly what you're talking about. So it's pretty good. Right. Well, and I don't want to make you wait. And you're standing next to the bank and I know you've got something that happened this week that's super exciting and I want to talk about that not only your achievement but just the idea around it in general yeah oh (laughs) what I was gonna say was you're standing next to your bank which I'm guessing is pretty empty right now because of what you just achieved you want to tell everybody what happened yeah absolutely so this week I finally got my mount and this was uh it, it, it is kind of a long journey in Classic WoW, and it's kind of meant to be one of those things where you, you have to work for it. And so this is just the regular mount, not the epic mount. And because, yeah, you know, it's it's something that you are eligible to get at level 40, and you walk until level 40. You walk everywhere. We, we jokingly call it the world of Walkcraft for good reason. And so this week, pretty excited. Uh, right outside of Thunder Bluff, I got my, my brown Kodo. So I'm walking around on run, uh, riding around rather on my brown Kodo now, which is which is pretty fun. And it was I was pretty far away, honestly, uh, right after the show last week. I was still about half, uh, about half about gold that you need to get the mount away. Uh, the mount costs 90 gold total because you have to learn uh, the training for 18 gold and you have to buy the mount for 72 gold. And in classic WoW, that's actually a large amount of effort to get that much money. And um, I was able to get a, a lucky random drop this week of a, uh, a epic mace that dropped. And so I was pretty excited about that. So I was able to sell that and go ahead and get the mount. That's awesome. So you mentioned it was 90 gold. And for anybody that hasn't jumped back into classic yet, like how much gold did you have when you dinged 40? You know, it's really interesting because that question largely depends on what class you play. And as a warrior, uh, warriors typically have a, um, uh, it's a melee class, so warriors have a kind of a grind for leveling and you're always right on the edge of dying and you don't have a self-heal. So the actual leveling experience gets to be quite um, quite arduous. But, but what that means is that you're always repairing. And so you're constantly churning through a little bit of money more often than, say, classes that are caster classes or range classes. So... I I was probably only sitting at about 25 gold when I dinged 40. I mean, that's a pretty long way away. I mean, that that 25 gold probably 
was the sum of, you know, 50 to 60 hours of gameplay already at that point. So I think, I think it's, it's just important to understand that, that the amount of invest time it takes <clears throat> an investment to get the mount makes it special. And that's really one of the things that I, I enjoy about Classic WoW is that the time that you put in is actually for a purpose in the game. Yeah, and I think for me, like even again, I'm nowhere near getting my mount in both level and gold, but I remember getting my first gold in Classic and then I remember leveling up right after that and basically losing it all to talents. So, so there's just this really big dynamic between currency and there not being this massive economy that's been around for 14 years. And it's really cool to see, again, like the, the rogues lockpicking on, or unlocking boxes on top of the bank. Um, you see people that are, you know, casting portals for gold or silver or copper, whatever they can get, um, paying for cooldowns, all these things driving towards in WoW, really the best like casual achievement that's out there is getting a mount. So I, I'm, it's really cool that you got it. And I guess the last question I have for you is what level were you when you finally did get your mount? So for me, it ended up being level 46. Uh, but you are right. The the casual achievement of getting your mount is uh, it takes a lot of time and effort, and it it's one of those things that it really is a it really feels like you accomplished something that you were working towards in the game, and so the time that you put in actually meant something. And so at level forty six, uh, like I said, I, I I got that epic mace that was bind and equip, so it allows you to sell it in the auction house. I went ahead and did that. Took a couple of of rounds of trying to sell it, but it sold it. And it just happened yesterday, so it's pretty exciting, and um, it is it is good that uh, now I'll be be riding around. It helps helps the questing grind as we get into the last uh, 14 levels here before level 60, and we get into kind of the more end game and all the other things that you can do uh, in WoW. So it's really the kind of the first major milestone that you hit along the way is you you end up getting your mount and working towards that and there are groups and it, it's a great thing that blizzard put in the game and from a design perspective from the beginning because there are groups that form that just run dungeons and and they 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 do a lot of social activity around just the concept of farming money and not even necessarily around xp although that is a byproduct of what you do but it, it is just around farming money so I, I was in a couple of groups with guildies where we just went through uh, a couple dungeons and all we were doing was just farming farming money and it's a it's a fun thing people accept it as part of the game it's not something where you you know you get too down about it you, some people may complain about it or whatever but it's usually all in fun because it's just it's just part of the deal and it, it's a uh, one of those noticeable things that sets players apart from each other uh, kind of really that first milestone so it's pretty fun that's awesome H have you seen any epic mounts running around yet on either faction so the epic mount uh, experience takes you to a thousand gold, and with a reputation discount, uh, you can buy it for nine hundred gold. <laughs> um, and there actually, we have seen a few uh, level sixties uh, run around on their epic mounts, which means that they're either really good at gold farming, or they had people that were collectively uh, helping them or trying to get the mounts. Now, now specifically, there are some players in Classic WoW that came from private servers and so they had groups and guilds from private servers that specifically went in and started playing a Classic server so those people are extremely well organized and the experience is you know probably 95% the same as a private server so I would say in general they had a plan they knew what they were going to do they were racing towards the end game to do whatever they wanted to do and so they're playing their game their way and enjoying their time and so if you have an epic mount at this point in classics release you you really you had to be intentional about how you did that yeah and i think you brought up a really good point here while we're on the topic you know you mentioned that there's some people that played on private servers you mentioned that you know you know somebody that played way back in the day and then didn't play wow for many years and then you've got what we're doing, and I would look at the way that we're playing as casual, but even our version of casual is very different from each other. And so that's one of the things that I love about 
WoW in general, but Classic is even a really good example of it, is that it really doesn't matter how much time you're going to put into the game. If you're having fun and playing it your way, I think you can find the experience you're looking for in WoW Classic because of the advancements in social platforms like Discord and just all of the resources and tools that are available through YouTube. There's just so many things that you can get involved in now that, you know, before it was actually a lot harder back when, you know, I was playing Classic the first time. You really didn't have a whole lot of places. To, uh, you didn't have a ton of places to go to get the info. So I'm pretty excited that you're enjoying it. You got your mount. But it's also cool to see that, you know, someone's going to grind this out hardcore or play even more casual than I am right now. Um, hopefully you can find some fun and hopefully you end up getting your mount at some point because that was really the first like driving factor for me that really got me in this game was I want a mount. <laughs> I, w I want that Kodo, man. Yeah, and it's really interesting too because it's been a long time since there's been a brand new WoW server where nobody has you know called it their home and the economy is really starting from scratch and this the the entire experience is starting from scratch and so I'd say I'd say right now it's a really interesting opportunity that everyone has while they're playing because you literally are surrounded by 80% of the player base leveling in your kind of chunk of level and so it really makes things feel like a real MMO and the wow experience feel like unlike anything that you can do in the retail version of the game right now because there simply just is not that amount of people playing the game at that level and i think it's uh it, it's really been fun because of that and and along along those ways i mean there are different ways to play wow there's different things that people enjoy doing in wow that all apply to classic wow if you're a person who enjoys the economy playing the auction house those kinds of things that's all there for you to do and it's it's an economy that's very immature at this point which is really interesting because things that will sell later on once the servers have kind of flushed out their their leveling groups of people and you get a majority of the population at max level things that will sell for much much more money just don't right now because frankly the player base just doesn't have that much money to spend on things and so it's really really interesting to watch the auction house develop kind of as a as a sliding scale of value as as the whole game is kind of progressing right now with with all the people kind of leveling in the mid game right now everyone the majority of characters have got to be in that 25 to 45 range because that seems to be where the the uh, the majority of materials in the auction house are and it's it's really it really makes the uh really makes the whole uh, auction house uh, playing the game to make money in the auction house kind of skewed which extends the journey to get them out you know the traditional tools like uh, tsm or uh, the different kind of auction add-ons really don't work very well right now and so it really it getting your mount at this point in a wow servers evolution really is kind of a cool achievement and along those along those lines the people that have it now are are flaunting their mounts around and it's kind of a cool thing to say hey you know uh, i've reached that that point you know i was surprised to see that you weren't standing on your mount in front of the bank <laughs> You, again, I, I, we weren't really planning on going down this track, but you brought up some things that I find fascinating. And for people that are looking at how to make gold, you know, the auction, it's easy to tell someone, go spend some time in the auction house. And I'm one of those guys that even in the retail version of WoW to this date, I still like messing around in the auction house, even when I'm not playing any part of the regular campaign. And... The thing with the auction house is it's incredible, to Eric's point, just how much, like, dude, just how much the auction house changes just from day to day and how some items that, you know, no one really needed, you know, a couple days ago or a week ago are now selling more. You know, you get these items that are used in raiding that aren't really used in the leveling process like Swift Thistle, you know, rogues need that for their energy pots. And there's all these things that ebb and flow in value as the player base changes. So I'd encourage anybody just to take a look at it. And if, you, if you're if you overwhelmed or discouraged by the auction house because it seems really big, well, it is. But you can learn a lot about what's going on in the game just by seeing what's going on in the auction house as well. So don't be scared of it. Get in there. Yeah, absolutely. 
in the end, the auction houses really, uh, I would say, helped me get at least half of what I needed to buy them out. So uh, most people are kind of in that in that area right now. And the other the other thing about it too is it's lucky drops. So if you get a bind and equip piece that is very desirable for end game raiders, which is what I happen to get. Uh, then you get lucky and you get to get a chunk out of that gold uh, requirement that you're that you need to get and if you don't well you know there's just you just grind away because that's what the game is to so just grind away and and get to that that next spot but it, it's it, you can get there and if you're if you're listening to this right now and you're at level 40 and you've got 10 gold and you just can't really see yourself getting to 100 it, it'll happen it comes it, it, you start to quest and you start to get more it's, it accelerates on its own pace you just got to keep going yeah, and there's definitely a lot of support in it too. Like if you ask somebody good ways to make gold, like everybody has their own opinion and don't think that there's only one way to do it. So awesome. Congrats on your mount, man. That's super exciting. And since we're, you know, recording this week and with all of the events that have happened recently with Blizzard as a whole, we're not gonna dance around the elephant in the room either. But I do want to chat about what the internet believes is probably the worst thing that Blizzard has done besides announcing that the Diablo franchise was going to be on mobile devices. Blizzard and China. So, admittedly, I didn't really care too much about this when I first started reading it because I haven't been playing the game a whole lot. But honestly, just the news going on around this got me interested in the game in general, and we'll talk about my feelings towards getting back in the game here shortly. But it's interesting because, you know, I don't really want to get hyper-political on this, but I do kind of want to break down the facts for anybody who hasn't been, you know, paying close attention or, you know, you see these articles out there that it's kind of hard to tell what actually happened. So let's talk about facts, man. Yeah, absolutely. I don't really want to get super political on it either, but it's kind of hard to ignore it because it does affect uh, Classic WoW and affects the the whole Blizzard gaming community in general. And uh, it affected our guild. We had several guild members who were like, you know, I just can't give Blizzard any more of my money. I'm, I'm really upset about this. And so when my sub expires at the end of this month, I'm out. And so that was, you know, I appreciate their... Uh, principled stance for what they believe so that's that's cool you know you do you and uh, it just it's worth talking about because it's kind of going on and we didn't want to um, miss talking about it so basically for those who don't know in a nutshell there was a hearthstone player in China uh, named Blitzchung who uh, won a hearthstone mini tournament and then was being interviewed by the casters and the casters kind of literally ducked down so they were off camera and then he made a statement and he, he said liberate Hong Kong revolution of our time and this whole and then he put a gas mask on which is a sign of solidarity with the protesters in Hong Kong And if you don't know about that just Google it there's plenty of information out there and so uh, this this was a very controversial thing for Blizzard to deal with and so Blizzard has uh, definitely probably been having a lot of sleepless nights in the PR department trying to figure out what to do uh, if the some people agree with what they've done other people uh, don't agree with what they've done but what what ended up happening is Blizzard came out and said okay player who's somewhat popular in the scene over there uh, is gonna be banned now for 12 months and he's gonna lose the money that he that he had earned in the tournament and so that was the initial thing and then a lot of people then started commenting on the why why would blizzard do this and then they cited examples where other players and other casters have said things in different parts of the world where it's not as culturally sensitive to to do that like in china and no penalties happen to them and so basically what we've end up with is a situation now where blizzard is kind of in the hot seat because of the way that they've kind of reacted to this um, and it's kind of left us in a, in a weird spot so again, I, I kind of dug into this after you told me about it and you, you did a good job there just keeping it really concise so that we can just talk about the facts. Uh, I guess you mentioned that there's this thought that went out and people were standing, they're taking a principled stance that 
it's hard to support a company that's um, you know that 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 is reacting to this or is making taking action based out of it. But at the same time, this is this is pretty hard. I mean, I didn't know actually until you just said it that it was kind of orchestrated, right? Because you said that the uh, you said that the casters ducked down, and so it it it's interesting that it, it was more planned out than the articles that I read had led on. So that's that's interesting me having just heard you repeat that stuff back. Yeah, it definitely was planned out. The casters who were doing the tournament knew it was coming. They definitely were uncomfortable enough to not want to be in the frame while it was being said, and that's for obvious reasons as it gets clipped around Twitter and uh you know, it was, it, you just, they didn't, they didn't want their faces in that same frame with those words being said, uh, because of the, you know, the consequences to them, uh, potential consequences to them. Um, and so it, it, it's interesting. I think, I think that there's strong opinions about this floating around out there. And, uh, I think that's okay. I think it's okay to have a strong opinion about this kind of thing. Uh, I respect the person in our guild who took a, um, I took a very principled stand on it, and I I, I think that's okay. Um, there's definitely a lot, a lot to consider, though. Yeah. So let's think about this maybe from a higher level. Like again, I don't I don't want to go into the specific what they said, what Blizzard said, and the reactions because they've come back around already. They've you know redone some of the terms and the lengths of things and and who gets what, but. What do you think about, you know, a gaming company and the, you know, potential consequences a gaming company has over talking about social issues or social justice or injustices? Um, it's, su- it's super interesting to me because it just seems like a dangerous area for gaming companies to go anyway. But this was, <laughs> this was a pretty deep dive uh, kind of out of the blue. I think in general, uh, culture has definitely changed to where uh, gaming, since it's so global now, and the internet has made it easy for people from different cultures and different, I'll say, social expectations to all play the same thing at the same time. So we end up kind of in a scenario where we just, um, you just have to, you almost have to have an understanding that the actions that you take, which are normal to you, are could potentially be very unnormal to someone else. And again, I'm not defending, uh, I'm not defending Blizzard, and I'm not defending um, the concept of that they were protesting against. Uh, I, I'm more just want to talk about this from a different perspective and say, when you're a global company. And when you have people that buy your product or consume your product all over the world, you're going to run into situations that it's just going to be difficult to try to make everybody happy, if not impossible. I mean, you think about it like Twitter runs into this. Twitter has different policies for different parts of the world. And you can say, well, Twitter is censoring these people or censoring those people. And I'm not going to get into whether or not I think that's true or not. But I will say that Twitter has said that, well, in in this country, this, you can't say this. In this country, you can't say this. In this area, you can't say this. And so what ends up happening is you have you have a public tweet. So you put something out there into the Twitter sphere that can't legally be forwarded to users in another country, even if they're following you. And this creates a situation that companies that deal on a global level have to abide by the laws of the countries that they're selling in for one thing and also the culture of the country that they're selling products in and and everybody has the option to say i don't agree with how a, a global company has decided to deal with that situation so in other words you could say i'm mad at you blizzard i don't like that you punish this player for doing what they did so I'm not going to buy your product anymore and that's okay that's totally fine but what you have to understand is that the other side of that is this player that did it broke uh, broke the terms of service for being on the Hearthstone uh, casting tournament knew that did it anyways he chose to make a statement uh, a principled statement from his perspective and again I'm not judging that statement in any way I'm not saying it was right or wrong or or whatever I'm just saying that 
it was an intentional act that was done, and Blizzard responded the way that they thought they had to respond in the cultural context of where that happened. Now, there's there's more to it, and there's uh, there is companies in in China. There's social media in China that Blizzard responded to and they they definitely tried to make it seem like they weren't offending the Chinese government and that's really the crux of what the West is mad about uh, basically and and I, I get it I get it that there's a lots of strong opinions on this but I will say that I think in general we take a step back we have to understand that the internet has opened up uh, the world in a way that culturally the same product that we buy here in the free world, the free West, is not going to be consumed and sold the same way in in, in China or any other country that has uh, a censoring type culture. <laughs> and it's it's funny, and I'm I'm not trying to uh, completely derail us here, but I'm kind of laughing here because you know, as as you know, if you if you heard the last episode, you know, I play a lot of PUBG. And there's always this battle in gaming, I think, between... You've got classes of gamers, right? And you got people that play casually, you got people that play hardcore. You can call them noobs, you can call them tryhards, you can call them whatever. And the things that different categories of people in a game do can be very different. And can be looked at as weird or uncommon. And so then you, you escalate this into this idea that people look at things differently or weirdly. And you escalate this into a political statement made by a player at an event for a game that is globally recognized and is one of, if not the largest electronic card games out there that has a huge following online. And just from my perspective, it's like, Man, it, it was designed to make a splash. It was orchestrated to make a splash. Um, I, I don't think there's any way Blizzard gets out of this not reacting. I mean, I think they have to react or do something. So you, you just bring up a really good point that it, you got to look at the cultural norm for where this is happening and, and what's allowed. Um, and whether you agree with it or not, it's what's allowed by the law there for the contract there. And that's... Again, we can say whatever we want about it. We can have any opinion one way or the other. But it's just really interesting that something as simple as, um, you know, someone's views on something and, and orchestrating it on, on a global stage, it can blow up instantly and everyone knows about it the next day and is already planning on what they're going to do related to that company. It's just a fascinating story uh, if you just break it down the way we just did. I'm... I'm sitting here, my mind's like spinning on it. <laughs> so I'm actually kind of, uh, kind of blown away about the orchestration still. Yeah, I think I think in general we have to just take a step back and realize that most of most of our day to day life uh, outside of Blizzard, the context of Blizzard. But if you buy a product, uh, odds are part of it, or at least. Yeah, part of it. The manu- part of the manufacturing or, or part of its origin is coming from a place that you may not realize, may not totally agree with everything socially or whatever that is important. And, and, and I get it. I mean, the people that are mad about this is, is definitely, they are, they are definitely coming at this from a particular perspective. And, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just want to emphasize that, that I, I think everyone has the right to have an opinion on this. But I also think if you're going to go as far as say, I'm never going to do any business with Blizzard again, uh, that's a pretty big step. And and if you're going to do that, you know, be consistent in other areas too. There's plenty of other companies that have uh, taken the same type of stand and censored their products or, or done things to to change their consumer experience. And I think we, we really need to... Uh, kind of keep context here. Well, yeah, and I think you bring up a point that there's a lot of companies that have done similar things and in wildly different industries too. Like, I mean, off the head, off the top of your head, like, which what companies come to mind when you're thinking about a company that's done or said something similar when it comes to something like this? Well, in general, like for example, let's take Apple. There was an app that Apple had on the Apple on the Apple's store, the App Store that the protesters in Hong Kong were using. And um, Apple 
made a decision to remove that app because it was something that was threatening their relationship with with China more more it basically it came down to it was more important for them to not ruin that relationship than it was to uh, you know continue to have that app in their opinion and so right wrong or indifferent that Apple made that choice another example would be they uh, they actually changed the Taiwan flag emoji uh, to be uh, something that was more acceptable to the Chinese government and so that's Apple right that's Apple making a conscious business choice to not uh, be in a situation where they're creating conflict with China because frankly they need China they need China to make iPhones that we can use here in America to protest on which if you think about that the irony of that and and where people are right now at getting really upset with Blizzard I I, I get it I get it I mean the the, the corporate uh, the idea of a global company uh, keeping everybody happy all around the world and every culture is just not realistic and I think all of us need to understand that, unfortunately, um, the largest game market in the world that's untapped is in China. And if any of these companies want to stay in business to keep making games for us, there's going to have to be some kind of a, uh, a balance there where the games are playable all around the world. Well, and furthermore, you've got some of the largest investing companies that are funding these global games are based in China. Like the one that comes to mind is Tencent. They have majority or minority stakes in almost every major gaming company out there or studio or whatever it is. These guys have monster stakes in the gaming world. Because of that, China knows that gaming is massive in China and so does the rest of the world. So you it's a great point that we absolutely, I don't say we, but the gaming world, I was about to say we absolutely need China, but what I'm going to say is right now the way that the gaming world is structured is that China has huge stakes in almost every game and we've you got to pay attention to how they operate because they have a ton of control over how certain things get done in the gaming world. Yeah, and the reality is that the companies took the money, right? You know, and it's and that money has allowed them to create all kinds of different products. And good, bad, or indifferent, that's the state of gaming right now. It's not to say that it won't change in the future, but as of right now, we're in a position where uh, the largest untapped market is in China, and so you're going to see these large global entertainment companies, uh, the the Activisions, the EAs, the Riots of the world you're going to see them actually say, okay, the next step for our growth corporately is to get into the Chinese market. And that is going to be a messy step. And we're seeing that messiness come out in here in this situation. And I, I, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not even saying that I'm not giving you my personal opinion because I don't think it matters. I, I want to talk about this from a general gaming perspective. And I think in general, the gaming community uh, is a very principled one. And I respect that about my people, our people. But at the same time, I think we have a tendency to really overreact and not understand what's going on uh, from a you know a hundred thousand foot view here and see. Uh, I think Blizzard's in a tough spot. Uh, I I think Blizzard definitely could have handled this better. I think I think it's it, you could say that fairly without getting too controversial and say that this could have been handled probably a little bit more consistently across the different uh, bannings and unbannings and refunds of, of money and takeaway of money and, and what have you. So because of that, it's kind of fueled the, the, controversy, the controversy birds out there. And I think that uh, I think it's going to be one of those things. We'll see where it ends. BlizzCon's coming up in two weeks, and that is going to be huge because you literally have Blizzard's showcase you know, expo of all of their products, all of their big reveals they have planned. I mean, think about this. We're looking at BlizzCon, potentially rumors of Diablo 4, uh, looking at um, the next WoW expansion, all of these things. The, the, the players that were supposed to play, some of those players that were going to play in the tournaments that were actually uh, the live world tournaments have been banned. 
And so it's kind of one of those deals where it's like, okay, you know, how is Blizzard going to handle this? So I really think that uh, that's going to be interesting to watch. Wow, dude. I honestly, I didn't even realize that BlizzCon was so, so close. I mean, honestly, after our uh, TwitchCon fiasco, <laughs> I, I, I sort of forgot that <laughs> that BlizzCon was was happening in the near future. But man, that just kind of blew me away. Like... It's going to be really interesting to see if BlizzCon's attendance goes down or if there's a protest or what's going on. And wow, uh, what a what an interesting, perhaps poor timing. I don't know. What? <laughs> I Honestly, that's crazy. I didn't even think about it. That's funny. But you, you brought up a few things, right? There's, these players were li- lined up for these tournaments. There's These players were potentially uh going to be in the money as soon as you know 3 4 weeks after after this happened and now there's bands out there and there's there's casters and things that have to get replaced like that's crazy what a what an interesting deal no wow blizzcon 2 weeks that's wild yeah it's it's crazy and i think what's going to end up happening is Blizzard just is going to have to deal with the fallout of whatever this is. I mean, it's realistically, it's too close for them to make any meaningful change before. Um, I'm sure it'll be, it, they may address it as a, in the keynote or take the public forum that they have for themselves to do something during BlizzCon. Um, I think, but again, I'll come back to one of the points we made earlier that Being a global company, you're going to sell into different cultures, into different governments, different rules, right? It's just not the same everywhere in the world. And you can't, you just just have to understand that. And Blizzard chooses to be part of the global economy. And because they choose to be part of the global economy, you accept certain risk as well as the financial gain from that. And so, yes, they're making money by selling their products in China. But then you end up in scenarios like this, where the internet gives a vehicle for people who have a different opinion, and then it, it spills over into entertainment, into Blizzard, uh, Blizzard's games, and so they have to deal with this. So, and, and plus, you got to remember too the the idea of casting tournaments. I th- I mean, we definitely esports is is kind of you know kind of been around for a while, but still is very immature. We are still. We are in the very early stages of developing what exactly esports is going to mean, and casting, and all these different types of games, and, and and just the public realm of how these people, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. Right now, it's just kind of a free for all. I mean, if you think about what the internet's done for uh, podcasting and esports and casting, I mean, look at us—we're just two dudes talking into YouTube right now. So I think that, I think because of that, you know, who knows where this is going to go, but this is not the last time this is going to happen for sure. No, it's not. And for crying out loud on the uh, PUBG podcast that I run, we were hosting and I'm casting a tournament next week, <laughs> you know? So you're right. Esports is a very interesting, uh, still rather niche, but growing rapidly uh competitive arena in the world and especially in the world of gaming but it's you know it's starting to get recognized globally even from people who aren't familiar with gaming so this is a just a really kind of fascinating deal where the the stage is big enough to make a global splash but even for me who i haven't really been paying attention to hearthstone specifically but even Blizzard in the last couple weeks, it, it hit my feeds. I couldn't get away from it. So, yeah, I, this is going to be really interesting to see what they do. And it, and it probably is just a fallout scenario. I guess my opinion now, having discussed it, is I, I kind of hadn't made up my mind on what I think is going to happen. But now I feel like, you know, maybe the attendance goes down at BlizzCon. Maybe it doesn't because, you know, they say all news is good news. But... Now it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with announcements and things of that nature because it's almost like you expect them to address it being so close to this. But yeah, I guess we're going to find out. What I'm fascinated to watch is the social reaction at BlizzCon. This could be one of the first times for Blizzard 
that they've ever had their own gaming customer protest them. It's just, if you look at the history of Blizzard and what the following, almost cult following that Blizzard has, and I call it that, uh, being a proud member of it, I, I love Blizzard games, I have loved Blizzard games for 20 years, and they, the people that started Blizzard really understood gaming. Yeah. And over as, a, as any company grows, things change, and this is really the fallout and the natural progression of that. I mean, think think about how much how many people in the gaming world dog EA, right? You know, EA has ruined all these games or, you know, whatever. I, like, I'll give you an example of one, one of my favorite... Uh, favorite games of all time, Command & Conquer, w- was made by a company named Westwood Studios back in the late 90s. And Westwood was obviously bought up and sucked up into the EA orb. And then it was completely just monetized in just crazy ways. And, and people were really upset about that, right? So is it, it, as gaming companies grow, I think that they end up obviously having more influence and as any company grows it doesn't have to be an, a gaming company but any as any company grows and has more influence you you end up over time with problems of you just have more influence so that means you're a bigger target and that means that the products that you make are used in ways that you never intended them to be used and that's exactly what happened with this particular protest statement blizzard didn't sanction this or create it or whatever blizzard just had a byproduct of their their casting event as a conduit for this to happen. And so when you when you look at that, you're like, okay, you can be mad at Blizzard uh, for how they dealt with it. I think that's totally appropriate. You can have an opinion on that. But any company that does business globally is going to end up in a situation where this could potentially happen. Because it doesn't matter what's going on in the world, there's always going to be groups of people that disagree. And then there's always going to be groups of people that disagree on how that disagreement is handled. Right. And furthermore, the more we talk about this, the more I'm realizing, generally speaking, and like last year's a great example, Blizzard has a pretty good history of making their fans, making the gamers happy, meaning everyone gets excited about the product. Like gamers last year couldn't have been more excited to see the Diablo logo hit the BlizzCon screen in the opening ceremony. And then... (laughs) And then it came out, it was mobile, and people freaked out. Now they've had something happen really close to BlizzCon that it was in the Hearthstone world, but it resonated throughout the entire community, and we're seeing the reaction from the fans and the subscribers and the gamers from all of the different platforms talking about it. So I just got a whole heck of a lot more interested in BlizzCon because... Not only do they have to re-satisfy or earn some trust back with what they announced this year, but they're also fighting probably one of the worst, I don't know, yeah, probably one of the worst, like, sentimental feelings towards any BlizzCon in history from last year because of the Diablo thing. So, man, this BlizzCon, again, for me, (laughs) just got a lot more interested in the news that, that comes out of it or the feeling that the general population has after uh, all of this has just happened in the recent future, and they're coming off of a pretty bad year as far as BlizzCon is concerned. Well, Blizzard made a classic mistake in marketing last year at BlizzCon, and they really, they they could have created excitement around a mobile Diablo game, but what they didn't understand is that BlizzCon is primarily attended by PC gamers. These aren't mobile gamers that attend BlizzCon. The only mobile gamers, really, that are at BlizzCon are people who are playing Hearthstone. Because right. I would guess, I don't know what the metrics are off the top of my head, but I would guess over half the players that play Hearthstone is on an iPad or a tablet or a phone or something like that. But yeah. if you're if you're looking, if you're really looking at Diablo, they really should have uh, uh, they should have like premiered the Diablo mobile game. Maybe at Gamescom or maybe at somewhere else where you're going to have a much larger cross section of of like console gamers, mobile gamers, and PC gamers. But BlizzCon itself has always been very traditionally uh, centered at the Warcraft crowd, and the Warcraft crowd is obviously a PC gamer crowd. And so when they got up on stage and they said, you know, 
you know, don't you guys have phones? You know, it, which became a meme all over the internet, which was terrible. I mean, it was an off the cuff statement by someone who I think was genuinely surprised at the reaction that they got. This was their big thing that they were going to announce. And they, Blizzard just doesn't understand. Uh, when I say Blizzard, I'll say the current crop of Activision people leading the company don't understand that there is this legacy base of people who are very passionate about the PC gaming experience. And even though in the future, a lot of future money is being spent in mobile development, and you can't stick your head in the sand and pretend that's not happening. I mean, uh, the, the future is in mobile gaming, and the numbers are staggering, and the Chinese market is, is that market. But the place to unveil that was not BlizzCon in front of all the people that love you for 20 years of PC gaming. Well, that's just it. And it's, it's, it's more than just PC gamers showing up to BlizzCon. I would consider myself a gamer lifelong Blizzard fan. I mean, one of the first games that got me into gaming was Diablo 2. That's the first one that I really had some sleepless nights over and pulled some all-nighters, you know, back in high school. But I've never been to BlizzCon, right? So even beyond it just being a primarily PC crowd, it's one of the most hardcore segments of the PC gaming crowd that they're finding there. And so, yeah, it, and I get it. I'm, I'm sure as they prepped all of that stuff for this mobile announcement and coming off the heels of how successful Hearthstone was on mobile devices, you know, you can see how they got to this decision but they, but then they announced it and it just exploded in their face because of exactly what you said. It really wasn't the right place to do it. So, yeah, what a, you know, the last 12 months has been interesting from a uh, Blizzard news standpoint. Right, and so now we're setting up a scenario where we're going to go into Blizzard's flagship presentation, right? This is their show. It's in Anaheim. This is their deal. And we're going into a spot now where Blizzard is going to end up uh, on the defensive when really this is this is kind of like their recovery year. Last year was rough and this year is their recovery year. And I would venture to say that they have some pretty spectacular things planned to unveil. And all that is going to be overshadowed by this. So, I, I mean... It, Hopefully they can find a way to uh, to get it back to a good spot. I will say in general, um, I like the way that Blizzard uh, does put a spin on things. And I will also say that the game designers for World of Warcraft, uh, which is which is my primary game, they are passionate people that when you watch them on stage, when you watch their interviews, you can see that they, they enjoy the game. And I think one of the most fascinating things for me personally that I'm looking forward to out of the BlizzCon sessions is I'm going to listen very intently for specific lessons they've learned from Classic WoW and specific direction changes just in general that they might slip by as they're talking that the Classic experience has, has taught them and the the community embrace of classic. So I think that I think that for me personally, I'm really going to be looking forward to that more than any kind of social protest thing or whatever. Yeah, and let's um, let's go there. Like you, you bring up a really good point, and we we kind of just went down this path that. And I hope you don't think we're being negative here because that's not the intent. It's just a pretty major topic in the news that we wanted to at least discuss because it's yeah, it's a big deal. But there's people in the community that were talking about leaving WoW or why they were doing it wrong and what needs to change. But there's also a really interesting thing going on in classic WoW that I think is related to the demographic of people that continue to play it, are intrigued by WoW Classic, and are going to continue supporting WoW Classic and the idea behind it. And you said something that is absolutely critical and in fact we titled our last episode kind of along these veins about what blizzard needs to learn about the classic world of warcraft experience even in this short amount of time and i think blizzcon's the first place that they're going to get a chance to you know talk about what they've learned or it, maybe you'll start to see some of those sparks 
that are starting to move around in the development team. But when we were talking about this before we kind of went down this rabbit hole of BlizzCon and the Diablo experience, which we weren't planning on talking about, but you called this the aging gamer phenomenon, meaning the, the demographic related to WoW Classic and why you think it's doing so well. So tell me about this aging gamer phenomenon. I think that uh, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience and people that are right around my age that I know that uh, played a lot of video games and then life happens. You have kids, you, you go down, your career progresses, you may uh, be married, you're not married, whatever, but your life just becomes uh, more filled with other things that take up your time. And I think that uh, the aging gamer phenomenon for me, I, I laugh every time I think about it, is, is, is someone like me who wants to play way more uh, than is actually than we're actually able to play, and uh, I just think it's it's interesting that the type of game that someone is looking for in that phase of their life is something they don't really have to go through a lot of effort to learn because it's relaxing to play something familiar, but it's more relaxing to play something familiar that you're good at and you don't have to try that hard to be good at. And I know from my own experience, it is, it's almost like it's lazy kind of, but it's just easy to play WoW because I've played WoW for such a long time. And when I pick up a new game, which is something we'll talk about uh, in our upcoming episodes, when I pick up a new game, it's a, just a, the, the learning curve is such an uphill deal. Uh, and it's not because I don't enjoy it. And I really do enjoy the learning curve, but the relaxation piece of it is just not the same. And so I think the aging gamer phenomenon with WoW is is very real. And I think that WoW Classic uh, takes people like me back to a time when we had more time, when we had more ability uh, to invest in a video game. And it takes us back to a spot where we were good at it and we can uh, dust off those skills and continue to be uh, good at a video game, which translates to true relaxation and true enjoyment of the experience. And so I think that uh, it's something more we can maybe discuss uh, in future episodes because I think it's uh, kind of a changing target but uh, definitely something that is fun to think about. Well, and I think this is what is really driving some of this hype behind WoW Classic is, you know, and again, the demographic would be people that are in their 30s and 40s, right? That were playing WoW Classic in their youth, in their, you know, college or early 20s uh, type years. And really where I see most of the hype coming for this game is people that look I'll be honest man I started playing WoW when I was 18 I think maybe 19 and I ended up raiding halfway through Nax I think we talked about that last week but there were so many like social things and stuff about the game that I just didn't understand like I had to be like seriously like beaten over the head by another priest in our guild back then to convince me why down ranking of healing spells worked and why it was better and why the way I was gearing my priest back then was wrong, right? And again, it comes back to this resources idea. There wasn't really anywhere to go that was really a trusted source on best in slot or what to do, you know? I, I like to flash heal because I could heal faster than other people and I had great reaction time from playing so much Counter-Strike but it wasn't the most efficient way to heal. And when we started running into problems in AQ40 and Nax, uh, everybody had to kind of wisen up and get a little better at the game. But it, it brings us back to this idea, these people that are like you and I, that are now in a more seasoned spot in life. There's a nostalgia piece, but there's also a maturity piece that says, you know what, I want to experience this game again with the maturity that I have now. And you brought up the word that is just so, that it's just resonating through the entire community. And it's this relax, right? It's just, it's fun to just hang out and play this game. So when I first saw the title in the notes for the aging gamer phenomenon, that's the first thing that, that came to me was, this is the game that a lot of people in their 30s and 40s, they're, and beyond that, right? I mean, we know that that's not the only demographic is. But 
it's relaxing. It's a, it's nostalgic, and and there's just a lot of people in that demographic playing this game right now. And there's an entirely uh, different and new phenomenon too. It's almost becoming a generational game. I mean, you and I both have kids, and we're gonna be in a position where our kids are gonna play this with us. And it's just it's just a fascinating thing where you get to do something that you did when you were a kid. Uh, with, with your own kids and I think that adds a different social dynamic to it that's just different than some of the games that are played today uh, by uh, by kids that are more mobile based or more um, you know there's just other games I won't get into specific ones but there's just other different types of games and, and an MMO that is a slower MMO is just more of a journey than it is a destination and it, it's just fun it's fun to be able to think that um, you know like a, a, a dad and a kid is going to play wow and i just think that as we as we kind of look at this um that's gonna be fun to see well and let's be real i'm not gonna have you know my two kids play PUBG with me probably so i think wow is it, it does it, it hits a lot of things that i don't think people were thinking about like if i had to pick between the two games that I, i'm really playing three games right now i'm playing a little bit of wow um i'm playing a medium amount of team fight tactics and i'm playing a lot of PUBG and in order of which game it's basically opposite of my playtime right now in the order that I would show these to my kids right now, you know? So yeah, it's, and I would have never even thought about that before classic having hit because it's a simpler version of the game, but it's harder and has such a huge, uh, you know, gap between the floor and the ceiling in terms of skill and what you can do. And it's funny because, like, if I was going to set my kids down in front of the retail version of WoW, I mean, you need so many add-ons. You need all this stuff to get even remotely okay at the game, and they're they're not going to be able to comprehend that. But in the in the base version, man, there's a lot of auto attacking that happens, <laughs> you know. So it, it's just a it's a much simpler uh, way to get started. So I, I think you're right. I agree with you completely. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to that when that comes about for me personally. So, well, awesome, man. I think, you know, between the <laughs> the, the the China conversation, I don't know if we anticipated going that long, but that's that's how these things go, and that's why we do this. It's a it's fun to break stuff down like that, and. You know, at the end of the day, our, our goal is we want to talk about things that are going on in WoW, our personal experiences, and, you know, tie the, the, the past times we've had with WoW to the new ones, like getting a mount and how exciting that is. And again, I just want to encourage you as, as you listen to this or you watch it, however you choose to, uh, you know, interact with us. If, if you've got questions or you're looking to do something in game, you know, I've, I've got a ton of knowledge from when I played it originally. Uh, Ronald or Eric here has got an absolute ton of knowledge as he's going through it a little faster than I am right now. But uh, we've got connections with people, uh, people that are listening to this, people that are in the XP community uh, that you can absolutely reach out to and lean on. Uh, and furthermore, we've got, you know, uh, the guild that is open to anybody who's jumping in the game or wants a community to hang out and relax with, well, aging gamers, because that's kind of who we are. So, as we wrap up here, man, is, is there anything else that, that you want to mention? And, and definitely mention the specifics on the guild and, and how to get involved with that. But I want to open it back up, see if there's anything else you had as we're wrapping up here. No, I'm pretty excited uh, to invite everyone who's listening to this uh, to Thunder Fury US. And uh, hit me up on the, uh, on the server, Ronald XP. I'd love to have you play with us, be part of the guild. We're definitely not racing to the end we're enjoying the journey having fun hanging out uh doing dungeons five mans questing and we'll get into raiding uh, when that time comes but uh, the whole goal is to have fun to be social and have fun and that's uh otherwise you know why do it because this this is about uh, like mike said about relaxing and so thunder fury us is where we are on the horde side for right now awesome and if you're looking for me or to engage with us uh, you can find us on our social media accounts, which will be linked in the comments. Uh, but you can also find me over on the Winner Winner PUBG podcast, or you can find me on Twitch, on twitch.tv forward slash MTB Trigger. And then on all the social platforms, I'm MTB Trigger as well. 
But as for this episode, folks, we will see you next week for more of the same, but a different gaming category. So for those of you that stuck around, we're going to be taking you next week into a little bit of MTB's world, my world, as it were. We're going to be talking about Player Unknown's Battleground or PUBG. And I'm looking forward to this because we get to roll reverse a little bit. In the PUBG world, I'm more of the expert and Ronald is, well, he's a noob. <laughs> so so be honest, man. How excited are you to talk about some PUBG next week? Uh, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm such a noob at PUBG. PUBG is one of those games that it's just you got to put the time in and uh, you, you play for thousands of hours before you... You really get good, and uh, I think I'm at 26 hours played. So you know it's uh, it's good. I, I kind of enjoy hiding or dying right away. That's my two current strategies, and we'll make more sense of that next week. So tune into episode three. We're gonna have a good time. Uh, we're gonna talk more about uh, having more fun in a different game. So you can follow me at Ronald Gaming on uh, the Twitter, and otherwise, uh, you can go ahead and email the show. The link will be down in the show notes. But more importantly. Uh, if you've made it this far, shoot us an email. Uh, the email address will be down in the show notes and, or leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for uh, being part of this and we look forward to many more episodes. See you folks. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs>